Hi, this is Brother Richard. Today we're doing a lesson titled Demise of the Creation. In other words, the end of the creation that we are currently <clears throat> indwelling. The scripture gives us some very interesting principles dealing with the world that we think we live on is not the world that God revealed in his word. The first principle scripture teaches is that the physical creation is nearing its end. We live in an old creation. Turn to Hebrews, the first chapter, verse 10 to 12. It says, Now, Lord, in the beginning has laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the works of thine hands. They shall perish, but thou remainest. They all shall wax old as doth a garment, as a vesture shalt thou fold them up, and they shall be changed. But thou art the same, and thy years shall not fail. So there are many scriptures that tell us that the heavens and the earth are going to pass away. Many scriptures that tell us that the heavens and the earth wax, have waxed old, and they're coming to the end of their endurance. God designed this creation only to endure until his purpose for it was achieved. Then it would go out of existence. Scripture teaches the heavens are covered with a shroud of blackness which veils them from observation. So no, no man, no human being has ever seen the heavens. Turn to Isaiah 50, verse 3. I clothe the heavens with blackness and I make sackcloth their covering. So the heavens are covered over. <clears throat> the science that we know has been struggling for a long, long time to try to comprehend the creation that we live in. The closest it ever come, has ever come to, from a secular perspective, has been Einstein, who dealt with what he calls the fabric of space-time, which is what you see when you look up into the heavens. Yes? He was, he was taken out of the domain of the physical into the domain of the spiritual. That's what he sees. From the, from the natural perspective, man cannot see the heaven. So the blackness is the spiritual? No, blackness is spiritual and physical. That's the secret of it. There's a blackness yes. that's spiritual and there's a blackness that's physical. The, no, you can turn it off, yeah. Yeah, it's okay. Man being physical can't see into the spiritual. But man in Christ being spiritual can see both. So we're speaking here from the natural perspective. Man in the physical has never seen the heavens because they're cloaked over, they're covered over by darkness. Okay. Yes, turn to Genesis, first chapter. Which God removed the fall? No, he we didn't remove it. He well, didn't, he just we just took fall beyond it. Which is part of his heritage. Genesis, Genesis first chapter. Verse 2. The earth was without form, without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. This is what the Lord is talking about in Isaiah. The heavens were covered. At the time, the Luciferian revolt is a sign of mourning. Creation was totally destroyed through sin and rebellion. So the darkness was a, a judgment upon the individuals that partook of this and those that were part of the creation. This is long before the human race came into being. Uh, so before the fall, they still couldn't see up to the heavens. Before the fall of what? Man? Yeah. yeah. Uh, no, way before that. No, uh, um, yeah. Uh, what happened though during the Adamic period, 
was that the earth was in a position in which everything was in a light state because man had not fallen. Day night cycle, darkness didn't come in until after man's fall, where he was basically brought himself into that same uh, state that all the others had brought themselves into through rebellion. Yes. Was the veil initiated at the same time that um, these birds had come across the earth? Yeah, during the rebellion, yes. That's when everything <clears throat> took place. <clears throat> sure. No. Before the fall, was there time? There was time, yes, but not in the sense that you have time now. I just pretty much had a thought that time kind of is a stand for life, life and death. And once death was initiated, through the fall of man, I'm thinking time started. I yeah. don't know. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Exactly. Was that what marked his hourglass, so to speak? Yeah, it's the initiation of the start of things. Man was outside of that type of a time until he fell. And then he was brought into that so that the conditions of what we call time didn't really affect him until he fell. Just like the law of sin and death didn't affect him until he triggered it. And then the conditions changed. Mm -hmm. Right. Exactly. Exactly. Man in his foolishness brought himself into a situation where he uh, greatly limited enjoying life. But let's go on. Scripture teaches within the shroud of blackness, which is space-time continuity, exist vast, stretched-out regions called the heavens. Turn to Psalms 104, verse 2. Who covers thyself with light as with a garment, who stretcheth out the heavens like a curtain. So what God had done was to initiate a stratified series of regions in the original creation. <clears throat> and he populated these regions with myriads of intelligences. Long again, long before the advent of the human race. Turn to Isaiah 51, verse 13. <clears throat> Now, we have an interest in pursuing this type of information if we are in Christ, because as you pursue it in the depths of it, if you're aware of who you are in Christ and what the Scripture says about you, then you become aware of the more you understand this type of information, the more you are going to come into an inheritance of it at some point in your future. Isaiah 51, verse 13. Here he's castigating rebellion. He goes on to say, Forget us the Lord thy maker that hath stretched forth the heavens and laid the foundations of the earth, and has feared continually every day because of the fury of the oppressor, as if he were ready to destroy. Where is the fury of the oppressor? In other words, he's talking about what God has done. God laid the foundation of the earth. He stretched out these vast regions above it, far above it, and he populated them. Read that in Isaiah 40, verse 22. 
Scripture teaches these heavens were created to be inhabited by myriads of non-human intelligences. Humans, mankind, was created for life on earth, not life in the heavens. Isaiah 40, verse 22. It is he that sitteth upon the circle of the earth, and inhabitants thereof are as grasshoppers, that stretcheth out the heavens as a curtain, and spreadeth them out as a tent to dwell in. So the habitations, abodes, for myriads of non-human life forms. Turn to the Gospel of John, 14th chapter, verses 1 to 2. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. The word mansions there means dwellings, abodes, habitations, many of them. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. I notice a lot of people confuse this when they talk about my mansion. Identify this word mansion. That's not what the scripture is saying. He doesn't say he's going to prepare a mansion for us. He says the mansions already exist. They're inhabited. He's going to prepare a place for us. That place is at the throne, the right hand of God, where he is, so that you inherit and oversee one day all these habitations. Yes? It's myriad. Each level of heaven is radically different from the other level of heaven. God is a God of prolific. Uh, he doesn't like repetition. And he creates in a myriad of variations. You can see life on earth in the variations of life forms here. So there is no one um, basic. The, the, the basic concept is what we would be concerned with. Life that is uh, called... Uh, Anthropoid, in other words, human-like, which there are a myriad of them, of course, but you have non-human-like life forms that populate the heavens. Huh? Anthropoid, Anthropoid man-like. So no oh, yes, it depends on, uh, on uh, the, the description that you would receive. If the prophet has a vision, you can get it, like, turn to Ezekiel, first chapter. Ezekiel. Here you're given a vivid description of certain life forms. Ezekiel, the first chapter. And what they're like. Ezekiel 1, verses 1 to 2. Oh, yeah. Okay, did you want a lesson? <laughs> okay. Um, you got a spare lesson, Fishman? Yeah, he's got to leave, so he's going to take it with him. Ezekiel, the first chapter. Verses 1 down to 10. Now it came to pass the 13th year of the first month, fifth day of the month, I was among the captives of the river Cherbon, that the heavens 
were opened and I saw visions of God. So the darkness, space-time continuity was parted. And Ezekiel looks up and he sees something taking place out of the heavens. In other words, the natural heavens that we see were parted and the reality that exists beyond them was exposed for a certain time. And he sees the circular light coming down. And this light is bright red. It's glowing. It's uh, actually, it's yellowish, reddish yellow. And there, are, there is a circular part underneath it. He sees it from bottom up and this thing is descending. And there's a darkish amber circular uh, pertinence at the bottom of this as this descends toward the earth. And out of it come four creatures. And he begins to describe what those creatures look like. Is that an odor or is that a mode of transportation? Mode of transportation. Notice how he describes it. Verse 2. The fifth day of the month, which was the fifth year of King Jehoiakim's captivity, the word of the Lord expressly came unto Ezekiel, the priest, the son of Buzai, in the land of the Chaldeans, by the river Chebar, and the hand of the Lord was there upon him. And I looked, and behold, a whirlwind came out of the north, a great cloud and a fire enfolding itself, and a brightness was about it, and out of the midst thereof as the color of amber out of the midst of the fire. So he sees this fire circle coming down as the heavens are opened, and as he sees the bottom of this thing, he sees a darker circle appearing, and out of this darker circle come creatures out of the vehicle. Now, it's talking about, when it says in the midst, it's talking about the throne isn't just a chair, a seat. The throne is a vast area. And in this area, you have individuals that are in positions, seated positions. And some of them, you talk about the four living creatures, which are not these creatures. These are cherubim. Those four living creatures are seraphim. They're much higher than the cherubim. Yeah. <clears throat> but no, this is talking about the father's Elohim, Elyon, and <clears throat> where he is seated. You will notice it describes that radically different than what's being described here. <clears throat> There's a canopy over this vast region, like an emerald. It's light. It says it's a rainbow uh, above the throne. This is described also in 1 Timothy, about the sixth chapter, where he talks about a, an impenetrable light, unapproachable light, where God dwells. And <clears throat> that's what John is describing. It doesn't move, it's stationary. But in the midst, around about it, activity is taking place in that respect. Well, let's go back to this one. Ezekiel's standing there and he's watching these things descend above his head. And he begins to describe them. <clears throat> Verse 5, also out of the midst thereof came the likeness of four living creatures. And this was their appearance, and they had the likeness of a man. So they were anthropoid. They were humanoid. They had chest, feet, head, arms. Everyone had four faces, and everyone had four wings. So this is where they differ from the human species. <clears throat> they have four faces. Instead of one head with one face, they have one head, and there are four faces. Each face faces a particular direction. So there's four beasts, four faces, so there's actually four eagles, four oxen, four men, and faces. Well, the, the, each face basically belonged to one individual. So you've got four individuals with yes. four faces. Yes. Who are winged creatures, huh? Six faces. Uh, yeah, but four creatures. Yeah, God, that's okay. God, I'm telling you, God creates in a variety of uh, strata. 
So he goes on to talk about these creatures. Out of the midst thereof came the likeness of all living creatures, and this was their appearance. They had the likeness of a man. Everyone had four faces, and everyone had four wings. Their feet were straight feet, and the sole of their feet was like the sole of a calf's foot, in other words, cloven hoofs. And they sparkle like the color of burnished brass. And they had the hands of a man under their wings, on their four sides, and they forehead their faces and their wings. <clears throat> now, when Solomon was building his temple <clears throat> in, in the oracle, that is in the, the, the region where everything was to be consecrated, <clears throat> he had four cherubim, or two cherubim, over the mercy seat. The cherubim were instructed to be 15 feet tall, and the wingspan was 7 feet, and the wings moved upward and downward. They basically, unlike birds' wings, they were fixed, they didn't move. Um, the uh, wingspan uh, of each one, as the scripture said, was about seven feet long. The being himself was about 15 feet tall. Two moving upward, two downward. Each wing seven feet long or seven feet tall. Feet, cloven feet, <clears throat> and these creatures <clears throat> sparkled, they glowed with the radiance. You couldn't get close to them for a very long period of time because you get wiped down. Yep. And then he goes on. <clears throat> Verse 9, the wings were joined one to another, and they turned not when they went, so they didn't move. They went every one straight forward. So the creature locomoted. They didn't walk the way men walk, although they had feet. They would um, glide very swiftly from one point to another. In other words, they could go to the horizon and back in a split second, which one of them did. And their, <clears throat> their legs were straight. In other words, they didn't bend. The legs were off the ground, and wherever they wanted to go, they would go instantaneously. They were not in, hindered by our gravitational field or the forces of uh, our abode. They were basically independent of that sort of thing. That's why when you read about UFO phenomena, it's the same situation. These creatures are not limited by <coughs> gravity or electromagnetic um, um, influences like we are. And Ezekiel goes on, verse 10, as the likeness of their faces, they forehead the face of a man, the face of a lion on the right side, they forehead the face of an ox on the left side, and forehead the face of an eagle. So you had <coughs> faces on both sides. One man, one lion, ox and eagle. So if you look at these creatures, you would be in awe of uh, how they would function because it's so radically different from humans. And imagine the head could turn if it needed to, but they had the ability to comprehend uh, a 24 degree circle instantaneous and they know what would go on, what's going on uh, totally around them. No, these creatures had nothing to do with the earth. They come out of the heavenly abodes. These are creatures that were created for life in heaven. Nothing to do with the earth. As a matter of fact, they are personal assistants to the Lord. They're called cherubim. That's a race of angelic beings that God created for life in the heavens. And to be a race that would oversee a great part of the creation. Yeah, that was after the flood. That, that's, that's different. And here's a newsflash. Lucifer is a cherub. A cherub. He's one of these, he looks like one of these creatures in his natural state. Oh yeah, the Bible talks about it. One day these heavens are going to open over earth. And people are going to be running and... Uh, but will be over them, not them us. Right. Sure. This is what I'm saying. This is your inheritance. 
Uh, turn, turn to First Corinthians, six chapter. Yeah, yeah, okay. First Corinthians, six chapter in your Bible, and a lot of it you're going to find shocking because people aren't taught. People aren't taught, and a lot of these leaders are going to have to give an account to God for keeping their people in ignorance. What do you think Christ came to Earth to die for? so that we could inherit the kingdom. The kingdom has nothing to do with the earth. It's called the kingdom of heaven. And everything that pertains to the things in heaven. We're being prepared for life in heaven, not life on earth. And Christians need to be prepared for what is waiting for them. Otherwise, they are not going to partake of it. Because they won't be ready. They won't be qualified. Notice, 1 Corinthians 6, chapter, verse 3. Know you not that we shall judge angels. How much more things that pertain to this life? That's your inheritance. That's what's waiting for you in Christ. That's only one small part. Um, before we go to Ezekiel, turn to Revelation 21, verse 7. Now this is God, the Father, speaking from his throne. He that overcometh shall inherit all things. And that will be his God, he shall be my son. Revelation 21, verse 7. <laughs> he shall inherit all now, if God the Father that stands outside of time and space and created all of this says the one who overcomes is destined to inherit all, A-L-L, -L, all things. Does that include what we're talking about here? Turn over to uh, Colossians. Colossians, the first chapter. Even more definitive understanding. All things. Colossians, the first chapter, verses 15, down to verse 17. Colossians, first chapter, verse 15 to 17. Who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature? Talk about the Lord. For by him were all things created that are in heaven that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities, these are angels, the names of angelic groups, thrones, dominions, principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. <clears throat> he is before all things, and by him all things consist. So he are the, he's the creator of these angelic beings, these creatures that we're reading about in Ezekiel. God the Father says that in Christ, Christ has inherited all things of the Father, and Christ gives all things that he has of the Father to who? You. You're, you're his body. You're his bo bone of his bone, flesh of his flesh. You inherit all things in Christ. Anyway, let's go on. What we're finding here is the creation and everything in it is going to become the inheritance of the overcomer. Angels, archangels, thrones, dominions, seraphim, cherubim, dawn star, you name it. One day, as you become an overcomer, God's going to put you in charge of all that he has in Christ. But let's go on. Go back to Ezekiel, first chapter. Now we see here a situation where from a human perspective it's difficult to comprehend. And it's not meant to be seen from a human perspective. This is meant to be seen from a spiritual, eternal perspective. What is being opened here 
is the hidden reality that exists. These creatures have existed long before the world was brought into existence. God created the, the heavens, he spoke them into existence, then he began to create on the physical realm, matter, uh, what the Bible calls Eretz in Hebrew, the, what, that which is firm. <coughs> These creatures existed long before man was brought about. And what you find is a description of them. <coughs> They're designed for life in heaven, not life on earth. That's why they seem to be so strange in the way they operate, the way they function. Drop down <coughs> to verse 12. And we're going to read verse down to verse 15. This is just to give you an example of how God designs life in heaven. Radically different from life on earth. Verse 12, and they went everyone straight forward, whither the spirit was to go, they went, and they went not when they went, and they turned not when they went. As for the likeness of the living creatures, their appearance was like burning coals of fire, like the appearance of lamps. It went up and down among the living creatures, and the fire was bright, out of the fire went forth lightning. So what he's talking about here is... <clears throat> spiritual influence that surrounds these creatures. It gives them the ability to operate, to function. It's, to a human perspective, something that the mind can comprehend because it's not designed for life on earth. It's designed for an entirely different uh, reality. Verse 14, living creatures ran and returned as the appearance of a flash of lightning. So, they would go to the horizon and come back in a blink of an eye. <clears throat> they are not restricted by time or space or distance the way we would be. Verse 15, Now as I beheld the living creatures, behold, one wheel upon the earth by the living creatures with its four faces. <clears throat> the appearance of the wheels in their work was like unto the color of beryl, and they four had one likeness in their appearance, and their work was as it were a wheel in the middle of a wheel. When they went, they went upon their four sides, and they turned not when they went. So what he's looking at here, <coughs> you have these four creatures, <coughs> and appearing with them are these circular, glowing uh, manifestations of light. In Ezekiel, it looks like a wheel. Uh, actually, in the Hebrew, it's like uh, the, the, the word wheel means rolling object. And <clears throat> these things are moving in particular direction. And as they move, the living creatures, the angels move in tandem with them. <clears throat> These glowing objects are the source in which the angels receive their ability to function in this earth environment. He says the life of the creature was in the wheels. <clears throat> so God designed their life to be external to their being. Our life is internal within us. <clears throat> we have a spirit, we have a soul, we have a body. <clears throat> to them, their functioning is different in their reality, in where they come from. So this is just to give you an insight into the fact that God creates radically different things because it pleases Him. <clears throat> One day, as you're open to the Holy Spirit, who prepare you for the things that you are going to administer, <clears throat> if you qualify for them, this will become normal and natural and comprehending. God is not designing you, when you leave this place, for a life that's anywhere near the life you're living now. Remember what it says in 2 Corinthians, the fifth chapter, verse 17. All things are new. All things are passed away. What did you think that scripture meant? You're a new creation. You are designed for a different life than what you came from. You're just as radical 
as these creatures are, when you get to heaven, your functioning, your ability is going to radically be different from what you are experiencing now. <clears throat> it would be commensurate as you understand the life of a caterpillar who's being changed to a butterfly. Radically different life experience. And this is what you are going through now. If you open your mind and allow the Holy Spirit to give you comprehension of what God is preparing you for, then the things of the scripture will become easier to understand. I'm going to close here with one scripture. Turn to the book of Colossians, third chapter. <clears throat> Colossians 3, verses 1 to 3. Actually, 1 to 4. <clears throat> Colossians 3, verses 1 to 4. If you then be risen with Christ, in other words, if you're born again, you were baptized. What is baptism? It's symbolic of dying to the old and rising to the new. Paul is saying if you have experienced baptism, this applies to you. Seek those things which are above. For Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. For ye are dead. That's what baptism was. You died to all this stuff that this world is dealing with. You are dead. <clears throat> and your life is hid with Christ and God. Where is Christ? It's the right hand of God in the heavens. <clears throat> when Christ who is our life shall appear, then shall ye appear with him in glory. So the scripture is telling us to mortify, put to death, those things that are holding us back that pertain to the earth. <clears throat> Let them go. Open yourself up to what the spirit in you is alerting you to of the things of eternity. <clears throat> no, that's not what it's saying. It's saying that glory is going to be your ultimate destiny. You're going to be changed first. And then all those that experience the glorification process will surround the Lord in the air. And then he will take that group off the earth environment, the earth's atmosphere, into the presence of the Father. No. No, when you, take, when you make the rapture of the earth and all the people will still be here, they get left behind. They're going to go through the tribulation period. You're going to experience all that stuff for a thousand years before the change takes place. Your change takes place first. Then the other changes will take place. That's true. So God is preparing those who are open to it for life in heaven. And let me make a correction here. This is another problem people have. The word heaven does not exist in the Bible. Let that sink in. The word heaven does not exist in the Bible. I thought I'd get your attention. The word translated heaven is always, always, always heavens. Plural. Plural. It's translated singular in many scriptures, giving the impression that there's only one. No, heaven's multitude. God is never described in the singular. Elohim is a plural term. God is compound unity. And everything God does is in the plural. Man is a plural being. We have three parts to us, body, soul, and spirit. So 
what you're looking at here, when you look at the word heaven, it's talking about a plurality of existence, levels, descending levels of existence. The only word that's always mentioned in the singular is earth. Life here is, exists in what's called linear existence. Linear existence is to get from point A, you have to walk to point B to get there in a line, a straight line. Life does not exist that way in heaven. It's radically different. So understand that what the Holy Spirit is doing in your life is preparing you, changing your thinking, changing the way you comprehend life so that it lines up with God's methodology of life in heaven. That's why you don't hear much about heaven in the Old Testament, because man could not understand the concept of heaven. Heaven is destined for those under the new covenant, not the old covenant.